the Quran does not have the answers, the theories spelt out. Because if they were, first of all, we'd stop looking for anything. And this uh, hmm. this invitation of the Quran to go use our mind and look for answers it has no meaning if all the answers are already answered in the Quran. If all the answers were there and then somebody came up with a different answer, what does that do with the Quran? It disproves it. So why would I even put it in such a position? And it's not the purpose of it. Every organism that has ever lived, that lives today, that will live in the future, the genetic blueprint of it is made of DNA. The percentages of differences relate to the how much we are similar or dissimilar together, which relates to when we had a, a common ancestor. Who is the closest organism that shares the closest percentage of DNA with us outside the human population? For example, at primates, chimpanzees uh, or bonobos, those are very similar to us. And the difference is like 0.1%. That's it, 99, wow. 9, we're similar. And, and actually, the way Islam looks at it reflects nature itself, which is as a testimony to the um, presence of a creator. So to me, evolution makes me closer to Allah, makes me a better Muslim and a better believer. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Doctora Rana Dajani. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. Very good. Um, so, yeah, I, I really wanted to bring you onto this podcast to speak about an important subject to me, and I'm assuming it's very important to yourself. But before we start, I'd like to just ask you: Can you just give a brief introduction uh, about yourself and what you do? Uh, so my name is Rana Dajani. I'm a professor of molecular biology uh, at the Hashemite University in Jordan. Uh, and uh, I'm also, I, and I do have two fields of research that I work in, uh, the ethnic, the genetics of ethnic populations in Jordan, the Circassians and the Chechens, we're the world experts on them. And wow. the second one is the epigenetics of trauma. Uh, so we look at how, how does trauma impact uh, our, our DNA? and what interventions can be developed to re reverse those impacts and whether those changes, those epigenetic changes can be transferred across generations. So that's my field of expertise. I do a lot of other things as well. I'm a mother, I'm an educator, I'm a social innovator, and, uh, and I'm an activist. Amazing. Um, so I, there are so many different directions I could take this conversation and I've done some research. I know you have a book out called, I think it's called The Five Scarves, correct? Am I correct? Um, and I'd love to just ask you about the research that you do. I'm very interested in epigenetics um, and, and all these different things. Uh, but I really wanted to invite you on to this podcast today to speak about a controversial topic within our uh, Islamic community or our Islamic culture. And that is the theory of evolution. Um, you have given some talks about the theory of evolution. Uh, and merging it with our Islamic culture. So do you mind just starting with giving a definition? What is the theory of evolution? A lot of Muslims out there don't really, may not may not understand what it is exactly. Yeah, thank you for um, giving the time uh, uh, for this very important subject for many reasons, which I hope we will unfold as we go through this um, conversation. Um, but first and foremost is the most important thing is what is the theory of evolution? <laughs> Before we discuss it, agree or disagree, we need to know what yeah. it is to provide mm -hmm. a basis uh, upon which we can all agree. So the theory of evolution, it, it provides the best explanation we have today as scientists to explain the phenomena around us in species um, over time, meaning to diversity, the biodiversity around us, whether in the ocean or in forests and deserts, uh, and how they have uh, come to be over time and how they are changing even today as we speak. So the theory of evolution explains that. And usually in science and in nature, these are laws, theories that actually describe phenomena and has nothing to do with religion when we're talking about um, nature and the phenomena around us. With that kind of introduction, the theory of evolution uh, it can be explained as as uh, as follows: that you have you there's a beginning of life that happened uh, many billion years ago. Nobody knows how it started, and evolution has nothing to do with how it started. 
And that's still up for interpretation by anyone. Uh, Muslims, we say it's Allah. Other questions say uh, somebody, someone else. Uh, other atheists tell you it's nature, whatever. But evolution, first of all, is not about the beginning of life. Evolution explains how after life started, how the different forms of, of uh, species or forms of life emerged. So there was one beginning. And through a long time, and diverse environments, this living cell changed through changes in its genetic material to come out with the different forms that we see today. So that's a very simple definition. Now to give you a more example, because examples always make it easier to understand what we mean. So if we were to imagine that there's a field of trees, olive trees, uh, these olive trees in this field are all olive trees. That's why we call them olive trees. They're similar enough to be called olive trees. However, they are slightly different from each other. Each one is slightly different from each other. Just like you could say a group of humans, you know they're humans, but they're slightly different from each other. So this field of trees um, is living in an environment. The environment may change, as we all know. So for example, there's a whole now uh, you know, time where the temperature is very high. So all these different trees, who are olive trees, some of them can survive this high temperature and some of them cannot because of the differences between them. And these differences have to be in their genetic material, in their DNA. So the trees that can't survive the heat will die. Those that can survive the heat will live and grow and produce seeds. So the next generation of olive trees will be the descendants of those olive trees that were able to survive in the heat, in the high heat. Now, after a few generations, the, the environment changes again. Suddenly, there's not there's uh, a lot of rain. So, of the, that group of trees who who we have today, who have the trait that they can survive high heat, some of, they're still different in other things and other traits. So, some of them are going to die and not survive the uh, high amount of rain and, and water, and they will die. And some will survive. And those who survive will survive because uh, because they, they in their DNA, they have uh, the genes that allows them to survive. So they will grow, they will produce seeds that will contribute to the next generation. So the next generation will be made up of a group of trees, olive trees, who are can survive high temperature and can survive a lot of water. Now, and they have other traits that they're different in. Another, after multiple generations, another change in the environment and now we're back to very low temperatures. So what appeared to be an advantage in a previous generation of being resistant to high temperature suddenly becomes the reason that all those trees die. Wow. But not all of them, because some there's still that different variation. So some of those trees will survive. Those who have a variation in their DNA that allows them to survive low temperature. But the rest will die. So those few that are able to survive in the very low temperature now will grow, produce seeds, and contribute to the next generation. So imagine this happening over an extremely long period of time. And if you compare the first generation of olive trees with whatever we can call the living species after a million years with huge differences in environment, you don't expect that the, the 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 trees after a million trees are going to be similar uh, with the trees that started in the beginning. Mm. They're going to be different, and the trees that start in the beginning are not don't exist anymore. They've totally changed, and that process that I explained, having diversity in a population, and diversity in the DNA of that population, having an environment that can change. And so some are more, uh, uh, have an advantage to live longer and produce offspring and some don't. This results in, in changes that are inheritable. That is the theory of evolution. And it's happening all the time with different organisms and different species as we speak. And it's a theory. A theory means it's been proven. With all the evidence we have, this is, it's a theory. And it, it has held the test of time, unless somebody comes up with new evidence that negates it or goes against it. But up till now, that's the, the, the best explanation we have to explain uh, the diversity of organisms around us. Okay, uh, awesome. That's, that was a great explanation. How, so I'm going to um, 
play devil's advocate here. I've done a lot of research on um, the Islamic community and the response to the theory of evolution and where things kind of get a little controversial. Uh, now, it seems to me that the biggest problem within our community is that we can accept that biological organisms can change over a long period of time. Uh, it may be gradual, it may be a little bit faster during certain, certain times. Uh, however, I think the biggest issue that we have uh, as Muslims is the connection between human beings and all of the other life forms. Uh, our current interpretation right now of the Quran is that human beings were created separately uh, by Allah and that animals were created separately. But this theory of evolution, according to that mechanism you just described, um, actually involves us being a part of life in, in a way that we did not expect before. So how can we address that, do you think, um, as Muslims? Okay, so that's a very important question. Thank you for sharing it and voicing it out because it speaks on what other people are thinking in their minds. Yeah. So I come at this particular issue from a whole different premise. So, and 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 I think that's what we need to first discuss. It's not about whether uh, humans are part or not. It's about the premise upon which we um, understand what is science and what is the role of religion. And I want to start from there because if we don't start from there, uh, we will not reach uh, a conclusion that is satisfying. Hmm. So, to me, as a Muslim myself. Uh, to me, Islam or religion in in, in general it, it tells me uh, how to live my life in harmony with my fellow human beings and in harmony with nature around me. So it talks about how I behave, about my values, about my morals, about my ethics. And it guides me and gives me the framework upon which uh, to live a better life. So what does that mean? If we look at the verses in the Quran, because we're talking about Islam as a religion, and we're talking about the source of the religion, which is the Quran primary, as a primary source, and even the hadith is about explaining the Quran, so we're going to start with the Quran. If we read the verses, many verses, they tell us, since we're talking about the topic of evolution, they tell us to use our minds, use our intellectual capacity, and look around us and explore and ask questions and be curious. And one can look at many verses that that ask for that and actually make it obligatory and, and tell us as humans, that's what we have an intellectual capacity and that's what we should use it for, to explore and ask questions. Okay? So therefore, uh, by, by, uh, by um, responding to that, uh, uh, question, uh, that invitation from the Quran, from Islam, from my religion, to use my mind and explore what's around me, um, it, that gives me that license to go and explore, and it doesn't dictate to me what I should or should not explore. What I what uh, what sh what is the uh, the theory that I'm supposed to find? It doesn't. It leaves it open, because I'm supposed to use my mind to do that. Let mm -hmm. me elaborate even more. Uh, so one of the verses uh, uh, talks uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, and I'll say I'll start it in Arabic, and then we can do paraphrase in English. It's a, uh, Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is like the, you know, like the, he's the first most important, not the first, but he's the most important prophet, Khalil al-Rahman, right? Yeah. In that verse, uh, Ibrahim uh, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring back the dead? And he says, Adini kayfa tuhi al-mawta. Wow, this is Ibrahim. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not Rana, a human being, a, a simple, normal, everyday human being. No, it's Ibrahim. And it's not asking another human being. It's asking Allah, the creator, the great power of the, of the, of the universe, of everything. He asks him. And what does Allah respond? He doesn't say you can't ask. It's haram. There's a red tape. You have to believe blindly. Because he's asking about something physical. How do you bring back the dead? Allah said, yes, he asked him, awalam tu'min. I asked him, why are you asking? He said, uh, 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 so Ibrahim answers, yes, I believe, but I, I just want to know more. Qalbi. So Allah doesn't say, no, you have to believe blindly. He says, go and take a bird and cut it up. And So this is like physical evidence. <laughs> this is a scientific <laughs> inquiry <laughs> spelled yeah. out. That you should not believe without evidence. That you should actually hmm. do your homework and do the experiments to prove 
anything before you can actually believe it or not. To me, that sets the blueprint, the roadmap of how uh, we should conduct our lives, drawing from the Quran, do we use our intellectual capacity, we explore nature, we find the evidence, and we discover the laws of nature that Allah had put. And, 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 those, are, and those laws that we discover are what we use to interpret nature around us. Now, if, and, and why this is important, because science advances. Why does it advance? Because every new human being comes with a new way of looking at the world because our DNA, each of us is very different. So we each come with a new perspective. Not just that, technology advances. So we'd have new tools that can see things or analyze things that we weren't able in the past. Hmm. So with the combination of those two, whatever scientific discovery we had maybe a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, a hundred years ago, may not necessarily be the uh, only uh, explanation. At that time, with the tools we have and the people around, that was the, whatever what, what was discovered was the best explanation at that time. Hmm. As uh, science advances, you can come up with better explanations. So for example, let's take physics because physics is a neutral subject. Newton, Newton discovered laws of motion, right? And then, and that was the best explanation for the laws of motion at that time. Now, fast forward, Einstein came around and he came up with a whole new theory to explain motion that uh, was different from Newton and actually showed that Newton was not right. All right, so Newton was great. We celebrate him, he did what he knew within his circumstances, but science advances, a new person came with a different way of looking at the world and he came up with a new theory. So every mm -hmm. time a new person may come or a new group of people with scientific advances and discover a new way to explain the world. That is why the Quran does not have the answers, the theories spelt out. Because if they were, first of all, we'd stop looking for anything. And this, uh, mm -hmm. this invitation of the Quran to go use our mind and look for answers, it has no meaning if all the answers are already answered in the Quran. So not number mm -hmm. one, from a logical perspective. Number two, if all the answers were there and then somebody came up with a different answer, what does that do with the Quran? It disproves it. So why would I even put it in such a position? And it's not the purpose of it. It's uh, on, uh, on the contrary, Muslims have been putting the Quran in a position that will dis disqualify it on the long run because mm -hmm. they see it in the long in the wrong light. And that's why I had to start with saying, what is the role of Quran and religion? Because if we don't agree on that, then we're just going into an argument that's going to disprove itself by virtue yeah. of starting from the wrong place. So, th so that's why for me, if we go back to evolution, uh, scientists along history were discovering nature. Uh, Muslims were doing it because they were uh, invited to do by the Qur by the Quran. And they were doing it very well, actually better than any other civilization, because uh, uh, for the first time in history, religion was actually asking us to be inquirers and to be curious. So mm -hmm. we thrived and we flourished and we made all these scientific discoveries. And if I and if we go back into that history, we see that there were scientists like al -Shah, scholars, Al-Jahid, Al-Khwan Al-Safa, who had actually came up with theories rudimentary to what we know today as evolution. And that was okay because they were exercising their mental capacities within the circumstances and, and um, the tools that they had at that time. And, and that was okay because they had understood, they were in the framework of understanding what is Islam's role in our everyday lives within the, uh, the scientific, let's say, inquiry um, community uh, or mindset. And it's only... Uh, later, when we stopped, on, and, and then the testimonial to this is that Christianity at that time, in the Middle Ages, was actually preventing people from thinking and exercising their intellectual curiosity. Well, at least one form of Christianity, because some people will object and say not all forms. I'll just talk about the form of Christianity that was against uh, science. Uh, and so people had to leave Christianity, leave religion, so that they could pursue science. We as Muslims didn't have that problem. We could mm -hmm. pursue science because that's what our religion said. And it wasn't connected to the religion because we had identified the role of religion in the correct capacity of guiding us of what to do with those discoveries rather than giving us the answers to those discoveries. So, uh, so in that context, um, I look at evolution. So to go back to your question about 
uh, uh, the verses in the Quran that talk about humans and uh, and how do we reconcile the theory of evolution with the emergence, for lack of a better word, of, of humans. So if we go back to the theory of evolution, which we discovered as a result of exercising our intellectual curiosity, we know, especially today, with the discovery of molecular biology and DNA, that every organism that has ever lived, that lives today, that will live in the future, the genetic blueprint of it is made of DNA. And that DNA contains all the information that these organisms need to thrive and survive. And the difference between every organism and the other is in the sequence of that DNA. And the, the percentages of differences relate to the how much we are similar or dissimilar together, which relates to when we had a, a common ancestor. So if we take humans, for example, within a community of humans, a population of humans, if we look at uh, our DNA, we are we are similar up to uh, almost 99.999 similar to each other as humans. We have that 0.001 difference that accounts for why we don't look like each other, but yes. we're human. But then if you go to our, uh, to the, to who's the closest uh, uh, organism that shares the closest percentage of DNA with us outside the human population, right? So uh, obviously there must be, because as humans, we have that difference. There are others who are going to be a little bit more different. And if you look, for example, at primates, chimpanzees uh, or bonobos, those are very similar to us. And the difference is like 0.1%. That's it. 99.9. Wow. We're similar wow. in the sequence of DNA. And then the further you go, the more the, sim the, the similarity happens. So if we compare ourselves to mice, the difference is more. If you compare ourselves to frogs, the difference is more. If we compare ourselves to fish, the difference is even more. If we, and we, we keep going further, further away, the difference is more. But we can trace just by virtue of mathematical modeling when, how long ago did we, we have to go to find a common ancestor for whoever, which two groups we want to compare to each other. And, and therefore, the DNA is the ultimate testimonial that we all come from one beginning and that with mm. time, according to those laws of evolution, we have become different from each other. And it's happening today. Viruses are happening today because viruses replicate very fast. So you can actually see evolution happening in front of our mm. eyes because uh, you don't need a long time and you could actually play with the environment to accelerate evolution. But not even that. We actually, you know, practice evolution in agriculture. You know, when you eat a, a ripe, red, tasty, great smelling tomato, that didn't come out of the blue. It was through natural mm. selection, but we we accelerated it as humans, as, as farmers, and through artificial selection kind of did it. So we apply those rules. So going back again to the human question, therefore, to me, the Quran is not about when it talks, when the Quran talks about Adam, it's not about telling me how Adam biologically emerged. That's not the purpose. The purpose of the story of the Quran, like all the stories in the Quran, like the purpose of the whole Quran, is how do I live a moral ethical life with my fellow humans and with nature? So the, the goal, the rationale, the reason of Adam's story, amongst other mm -hmm. stories, is to glean lessons, how to make good decisions. If you make a mistake, what do you do? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we can talk about the religious you know, lessons that can be learned from Adam's story. But the question here is about evolution, and Adam's story is not about the scientific discovery uh, of evolution. So I don't even try to interpret Adam's story in the light of science because that is not the purpose. And so the whole question has no meaning from my perspective. Okay. Um, well, in the light of uh, the, the spirit and uh, being inspired by the Quran and some of those um, people, scientists, philosophers within the Islamic golden age that you mentioned. And I'd like to add on, by the way, to that as uh, Ibn Haytham is considered uh, to be the creator of the foundation of the scientific method itself. Uh, he was the one who stressed replication and doing controlled trials. Uh, he, obviously, he was uh, very influential in the, in the field of optics. And he wrote this whole book about optics. And it was very revolutionary at his time. And the people after him actually took reference and, and were inspired by Ibn Haytham himself. So that, that's just to add on to what you were saying. Um, Dr. Dajani, I'd like to give you maybe some objections that some some of our uh, Muslim brothers and sisters might have that I've commonly seen. Um, what about this thing between micro and macro evolution? I hear this thing a lot where people will say, okay, we can directly observe 
microevolution, but macroevolution is not observed. We've never seen, um, you know, let's say uh, a dinosaur turn into a bird or a early uh, primate turn into a human being. So how can we be so sure that that happened? We can be sure of microevolution, but what about macroevolution? It's not observable. So is there some room perhaps that that did not happen? Okay, so first of all, your definition of micro and macro evolution is not correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, um, when we talk about micro evolution, about those gradual changes that are happening, macro evolution is that the environment is so different that there can be a, a bigger or faster or more abrupt change. But the laws of evolution mm. apply in either. Okay, mm. so... And, and so when you talk about macroevolution, it's not a dinosaur turning into something else. And it's not a, 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 a primate turning into a human being, like all of a sudden. It, mm -hmm. it, it's all based on gradual changes. But I, again, if the environment is shifting very abruptly, back to that, those trees in the field, uh, one of them is going to survive because it has this mutation that happened because... Um, of a of a of a radioactive thing that ch that changed the gene that allowed it to have an, a, a survival advantage for something. Okay, so it still applies. It's still the same. It's just like accelerated when you talk about macro. So you produce something new. So it's not about that we haven't observed. Uh, again, even so. Again, I I have a problem with the words you use about observing. We wouldn't mm. have observed it because we weren't around. Number one. Right, we only are a blip. If we look at the history of the universe, we're just the last minute of the whole year, uh, not just the last minute, the last few seconds of the whole year. Um, if we if we put mm. the scale of the whole universe, so obviously we're not going to see anything in our lifetime ever. And usually, with uh, with evolution and as you, uh, different traits accumulate, the lethal ones usually don't continue so the organism dies and so the um the prop possibility or probability of a of a beneficial mutation happening is always becomes less and less with time because the organism is more and more and more adapted to its environment and especially humans because we we can survive anywhere in order for us to change we would have to have really like uh, drastic drastic changes because we have it has been so long for us evolving and in order to hmm. have the drastic changes in the environment, it would mean a separation of species, it's a separation of groups and leaving them isolated for a huge amount of time with extreme environmental changes and so on. We, we will not, as human beings, we will not observe evolution on our species in our lifetime. However, we, we see it happening in other species around us, as I mentioned, bacteria and viruses. Um, but also, uh, and, and in order to see it in humans, you'd have to separate like two groups of humans for extremely long periods of time with extremely different environments, uh, mm. even to start seeing any any um, uh, evolution. And like I said, uh, the proof in the past was looking at embryology, looking at uh, fossils, but now you don't even need those. Mm. You have DNA and the DNA, you can trace uh, certain genes and how they've changed comparing species to each other. And so the only... A logical explanation is evolution. Okay. Um, another objection people usually have is uh, they say, look, look at the secular atheist uh, academics. They can't even agree on evolution itself. And they bring up this very common example of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck coming up with a theory of evolution 50 years be before the origin of species uh, it was released by Charles Darwin. And then there was this whole political battle and the Soviet Union kind of adopted this Lamarckian uh, uh, evolution, which is by way of uh, inheritance of acquired characteristics. And then the United States took on this mechanism of natural selection, which is considered to be part of Darwinian evolution. So this is a common rebuttal I hear is, oh, look at them. They can't even agree on evolution themselves. Therefore, it's not it's not really a, a heavy theory like like a theory in physics or chemistry would be. So there's doubt within them. So uh, those arguments are actually uh, created by Christians, especially Christians mm. in the U.S. <laughs> they created really? these, yes, and they use them to refute uh, evolution because evolution threatens their own religion or their their uh, their sect of Christianity. 
Because mm. if you were to um, agree with evolution, that means the earth has to be very long, very old. And according to the Bible, the earth is only 6,000 years old. So you have a problem. It's either Darwin is wrong or the Bible is wrong. And they're not going to tell And the Bible, in their understanding, is not wrong. Therefore, Darwin has to be wrong. So how are they going to disprove mm. Darwin? So they started going around trying to dispel, um, uh, create a myth, sorry, that oh, evolution is not even true. People are fighting over it. And they'll mm. even cite new discoveries and say, see, see, they just disproved it. And so these are all fabricated or mis, uh, mi misunderstandings or half truths yeah. that they mm. dig up and use to defend their stand against evolution. Now, mm. um, and I'll give one, just one example. First of all, scientifically, the theory of evolution is proven. It's the details of providing more detailed evidence that we may disagree upon. So, for example, one of the famous ones that came out was if we go looking at different fossils, uh, we there was like a skeleton, a bones of a skeleton of a very early hominid, meaning an ancestor of humans that was discovered. And the analysis of the DNA compared to our new modern DNA, we can compare and see how long ago we were ancestors, right? And that could put the age, uh, a time, uh, to when that <laughs> or that particular uh, form of hominid was alive, Okay. Now, then they discovered another new fossil skeleton record, and they said, oh, no, no, wait a minute, that age was not like, uh, uh, let's say, 500,000 years ago, it was 4,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, sorry. So it was like, uh, we're, we're disagreeing on some numbers, we're not disagreeing on the theory, <laughs> we're just disagreeing yeah. on the accuracy of some of the minute details. But what they do, these Christian um, people who are against evolution, they take that, oh, so we disagreed uh, about the age of that yeah. skeleton. And they say, see, they're disagreeing. That means that evolution is wrong. Now, so, and that's normal. Of course, as scientists, we make discoveries and we have discussions, but we're not discussing the fundamental theory itself. The second thing is that, unfortunately, what Muslim scholars do, because they want to go against evolution, and they don't have the scientists, actually, they go into those Christian uh, discuss arguments and they use them um, and uh, as proof that evolution is wrong. When in Islam we already we don't even have the problem because in the Quran, uh, Earth is very uh, old, so we don't have even the problem. So we're actually using the argument for the Christian problem when we don't even have the problem. So mm. so the whole thing mm. is 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 <laughs> misplaced. And that's why we need to take a step back, understand what is evolution properly, and then uh, understand what is the position of Muslims towards science. And then we can come to the conclusion that we don't have a problem at all. And that's why Islam is supportive of science. And that's why we, as Muslims, are different from Christians, where Christianity was against science. And, and you had to leave Christianity to become a good scientist. And those Christians who didn't want to leave Christianity are always fighting to disprove science. Why do we want to associate ourselves with them? Yeah, it seems like like perhaps an unconscious belief that was passed on or, or something of that sort. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so another... I can, sorry, yeah, I, can, I can give you analysis why Muslims adopted the Christian. Sure, yeah, go ahead. So, so I'll tell you why. First of all, if we, as we mentioned earlier, that there were Muslim scholars in the past as early as 8th and 7th century, who had rudimentary theories of evolution, and it was okay. Nobody said they were um, atheists or going against religion or whatever, because that separation was very clear. And then even after Darwin published his book, The Origin of the Species, there were Muslim scholars like al Jisr, who was living in, in the 19th century, in what today is Lebanon, who had read the theory of evolution and had no problem with it. Hmm. So this is even after Darwin came, when at the same time period, Christian groups were against Darwin and called him an atheist, because in their book, uh, Earth is, uh, like I said, has, has only 6,000 years. And if they're going to believe, uh, agree with Darwin, that means the Bible is wrong. So Darwin then is an atheist because his claims will refute the Bible. For us, his claims had nothing to do with religion. And if we wanted to really compare Earth is long, very old for us, so he's fine. To the extent, I don't know if you very a very well-known story, that the uh, American University of Beirut in Lebanon today, when it was first established in, that, uh, around the same time of the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a missionary school. 
And it was, uh, and so they had invited a scientist from the U.S. to come give a talk and become a professor there. So this scientist came and, and gave a lecture about evolution. You know what they did with him? They kicked him out the next day because, wow. oh my God, they're a missionary school teaching science. And then this guy comes and talks about evolution, which is against religion, Christian religion. And at the same time, I just was living in that same area and he was supporting evolution. So, so we didn't have a problem. Now what happened, he, and this happens always in the, in, in, in the world, is that there are a group of people from the West who used evolution and by association Darwin uh, to, uh, to support their claim that uh, Westerners and white people are better than other races. This is not what evolution is about. This is a, a, a myth, uh, 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 something they created using evolution to verify their intent, their ill intentions, their unjust intentions, their imperialism and colonizing intentions to, to go colonize the world and to subdue the world. And so there are other other discoveries have been used for bad purposes, like the nuclear fusion and physics, yes. right? They have been yeah. used to make a bomb. That doesn't mean the the the, the actual theory is wrong or hmm. bad. It's how you use it. And so what happened because of that, the people who were oppressed, the people who were colonized, which are the Muslims in the majority, there was an association in their psychology and their mindset, and rightly so, that evolution in Darwin is associated with imperialism and colonization. So obviously it's going to be wrong in their mindset. And that's another reason why they refused Darwin and evolution and considered it evil. Mm. And not just mm. that, we didn't have, by then, late 19th century, early 20th century, the all the Islamic civilization was going downhill. We didn't have a proper education. We didn't have scientists of our own who were Muslim, who like al said, who could say, wait a minute, guys, <laughs> we were different. We didn't. Small, so, yeah. so we used the colonizing uh, thing because it was real. We, we used the Christian argument. And I think I want to suggest that they used it because they said, oh, these are people of the book. We're people of the book. Uh, if they say Darwin is an atheist, then then they're probably right, and so he's an atheist. When when he he poor guy he was never he wasn't even an atheist. He left. He he was a, he he didn't agree with Christianity because it said life is uh, Earth is has a short time. But if he had learned about Islam, he probably would have been a Muslim for all we know. Because in our context, hmm. Earth is long, so he was an atheist in, from their point of view because what he said was against the Bible. But for us, what he said was not against Islam. So, uh, and he also, if one, if anyone uh, went and read The Origin of the Species, his, his first book, in the last paragraph, he says, um, there is a power that created this universe. And that his book is only about explaining what happened after. So this guy was a believer of a power that created the universe. Yeah. But yeah. he had problems with Christianity because of the reasons I described earlier. And, and maybe the last point here is that Muslims, unfortunately, will go and uh, talk about evolution without actually even ever read Darwin's book. And as Muslims, we should always, as in Surah Al-Hujurat, if somebody comes and tells us something, we should not believe that person. We should go and check the resources and read ourselves and do our homework. And we haven't. We base our uh, um, uh, our conclusions on hearsay uh, because he, see, he, she said, and we don't do our own homework to check it out. And the first question I ask anyone who disagrees with Darwin, did you read the origin of the species? And they always say, we know we didn't. And I said, no, don't, don't talk to me until you do it. And that's what you should do as a Muslim. I'd like to add on to that as well. I think there's been a second wave of uh, misunderstanding of the theory of evolution uh, by this so-called movement of the, the new atheists, they call them. Uh, people like Richard Dawkins, people like Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, they call them the four horsemen of atheism. And they've been so influential in Western media because it's always a debate between the atheist and the religious person. Sometimes it's a Christian, sometimes it's a Muslim person. And the, the atheist all uses evolution as a tool to try to disprove God uh, and try to you know kick, him out, kick it out of the picture that, oh, there's no such thing as a God, there's no Adam and Eve. It's all just evolution through natural selection. And I think people, because of that binary split have obviously taken the side of the religious people who were arguing against evolution unfortunately them maybe that they weren't informed uh, on the stuff that we've spoken about today um but now i've, I've recently found out but that no th this is not the case at all the example you gave is that charles darwin himself 
believed in a creator. He was, I believe he was the deist, meaning he believed that God created uh, life. And then this process was happening. Maybe there's divine intervention. Maybe there was not. Um, but I, I just, I think we really need to make this clear that evolution does not imply atheism or it does not imply naturalism, meaning no intervene, uh, nothing uh, supernatural or uh, something bigger than us intervening. So those things are entirely separate. So a person can believe in God and evolution um, at the same time. Um, so I, yeah, yeah and, just to... and maybe to add to that, therefore Dawkins and the other guys, uh, their arguments are fantastic to prove evolution. Um, yeah. And they, they only use it for atheism. It's because the Christians have a problem with it. We as Muslims can use all their arguments to support it because we have it does not contradict our uh, Islamic or our religious view at hmm. all. Bec and, and, and showing that evolution is evolution and the beginning is something different. Uh, and, and the beginning, we can have a discussion about atheism, about the beginning of all of that. But that has nothing to do with the evolution discussion. <laughs> Those are two discussions, very separate. Yes. For Dawkins and the others, they're not because they're they're arguing with Christians. If they argued with a Muslim who understood wh what I just explained, there would be nothing to argue. We would actually say we would agree with everything they said in proving evolution. Hmm. Okay, let's move on to another objection, if that's okay. Uh, this one I found by one, he's a writer and he has a YouTube channel. God bless his soul, his name is Sabur Ahmed. And he is somewhat, he's a Muslim who argues against uh, evolution. And he uses this argument of, oh, Darwinian evolution is not a fact, but he, he combines the words seamlessly, Darwinian and evolution to make it seem that he's talking about evolution, right? He's using this confusion tactic, I believe. But he also has this really interesting point, um, and he cites other secular atheists uh, to, try combat, to try to combat this idea of evolution, and it's the problem of homology uh, within our evolutionary tree. So homology refers to a similarity, a phylogenetic, meaning a physical similarity or, or a behavioral similarity between two biological organisms due to common descent, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, he says that, first of all, homology is an assumption. Um, and, and the reasoning he gives that assumption, he says, there's actually this counteracting force of similarity called homoplasy, or they also refer it as uh, convergent evolution, where there uh, occurs similarities between biological organisms, but it's not due to common descent. It's due to their environment. An example of that is a bat, which is a mammal, growing wings or evolving wings, uh, and birds, which have split far away from uh, bats in the evolutionary tree, also having wings and insects and so on and so forth. So I know this is a bit of a, an example that we have to go in, in detail about, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this homology and homoplasy uh, objection. Yeah, so those, uh, those arguments are very, uh, they're old and they're out of fashion now because of molecular biology, right? Mm. Because, and for those, it, it, they were only looking at the outer morphology, right? Oh, a bat has wings, a bird has wings. And so we talk about convergence and um, uh, whether it, because of the uh, environmental pressures that they all ended up with wings or not. I mean, we go back and we look into the DNA and the DNA shows us how similar or dissimilar these different species are. And that's the ultimate. So when they're similar to a certain extent, you can just trace that family tree of who came first and who came later and how far away they are from each other. And so that argument has no standing. It doesn't mean anything uh, because different organisms evolve differently according to the environmental pressures on, about them. And yes, they're all living in the same environment. And so they will evolve certain ways that could appear to be similar because of the similar pressures. But ultimately, you look at the DNA to draw those family trees. And that's why DNA is the ultimate tool to prove evolution. So this uh, person, with all due respect, um, I don't know, think he knows enough about uh, or doesn't hasn't done his homework looking at DNA and molecular biology and evolutionary biology in drawing those uh, uh, family trees and, and looking at the similarities between different species and how they evolved uh, in, in, the, in, 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 in the pedigree of these trees. Okay. Um, interesting. And then one more objection I'd like to just give that I've heard is that 
you may have may have already answered it to be honest with that um, DNA example um, that there's little evidence of of evolution or, or there's little evidence of transitional species between for example uh, a human being and an early primate ancestor or of any other example of, of any other biological being um, he he says that this is another argument proposed by him that uh, secular atheists themselves agree and say that 99.99% of living biological organisms uh, have gone extinct. So this, what, what we're seeing on life today and all of the things that we've seen, it's a very small percentage of the story. And he provides this analogy, which again was not, he, he, he references another secular atheist academic and says that trying to figure out evolution is like trying to figure out uh, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, which is a very big book, uh, and trying to figure it out while only having 13 randomly selected pages. Okay, so he's using this analogy. It's a very clever analogy. And it was said by uh, uh, an academic that we only have 13 random pages out of this entire storybook. Therefore, we can't be so certain and evolution is not a fact. Um, but I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to, yeah, you're going to rebuttal it with the yeah. DNA. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that, that that was the case when we didn't have DNA. We had to piece the puzzle together. And that's the genius of Darwin, that he was able to come up with a theory with uh, such little evidence uh, hmm. uh, uh, to, to prove it. But he had the intellect to see it. And not just him. Like I said, there were others before him who, who saw that. Um, but the ult and, and of course, you're only looking at fossils and fossils are not going to survive for every species that ever lived. Come on, we know that. You're not going to find every connection between the different hominids and every species and every change uh, preserved and just sitting to be discovered. <laughs> of course not. And that's why with the discovery of DNA, you don't need that. You can just go take samples and compare and go back and see using uh, mathematics and, and modeling, figure out how and using your mind, your intellect, your logic how they, when they were related and how much they were related. And you can even go back now with more technology and, and uh, knowledge, you can actually even, you know, uh, what's the, uh, uh, go backwards and try to imagine what they look like, what traits they have, depending mm. on the gene sequences that you found or comparing them with each other and how different they are. So um, those arguments were used in the past and they made sense because you didn't have enough evidence so you could use them but now you you have the ultimate evidence which is dna so they're all moot in that sense okay and i just so i understand the two main ways that we can uncover this uh phylogenetic evolutionary tree is by using homology uh, uh, similarity due to common descent and using the dna and merging them together and see because those are two independent uh, sources of, of finding information. And if they both line up, that just doubles down on our belief that this is, in fact, what happened. Is that, is that, yeah, would that be correct? Yes, but not every yeah. homology is going to make sense because homology is interpretation of humans. Right. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm, that tree looks like that tree. Right. Maybe somebody mm. else will come along and say, wait a minute. No, I disagree. I think this tree looks like the other tree. So it becomes very mm. subjective between you and me and our different perspectives. And so those homology arguments, I mean, you take them with a grain of salt because every now and then a new scientist comes in and sees something different or sees a new species. And so rearranges everything. Right. And then but with DNA. No, you, I mean, your DNA can actually solve a problem in homology. So if two people disagree about a homology, your DNA is the one, the arbitrator that will tell you which one was the right one. So it's not about, so you don't use homology anymore. You don't mm. you can only use it if you want to tell a nice story about your DNA. Ultimately, you only use your DNA. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and now to, to to finish off this, this discussion, uh, which has been absolutely a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Um, I'd like to shift over to how do we um, communicate these ideas? I mean, this is a big paradigm shift we're talking about. We're going from a story of us being created instantaneously, which is the modern interpretation, uh, Islamic interpretation of, of, of the beginning of human, the genesis of humans and all other life on earth, into this idea that we came from an animal. Um, and that's a very... That's a very different story. And I'd like to know how do you in your own classes uh, explain this story? Because you're obviously going to have some 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 friction 
Um, and do you think it requires a certain amount of emotional intelligence to be able to, to, to teach these things practically? You know, yeah, that's a very, very important point. So I remind everyone <laughs> that we, why, why did Allah in the Quran, uh, 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 why were we created? What is our purpose? Our purpose is to take care of our fellow human beings and take care of nature around us and earth and the universe. So we have a responsibility. Most people interpreted that as, oh, I am the strong. I am going to dominate. I am the one who has all the power. That's not an Islamic philosophy. That's a very Christian Western philosophy of dominating nature. And we see it today. <laughs> we see it mm. in the whole perspective. Islam was never about that. Islam was about being humble, being acknowledging that we are part of Allah's creation. Uh, we don't control it. We are part of it. And if we have a certain capacity, that's only to, to use it in service of, not in control of, the world around us. And, and so from there, those who, who have a problem that uh, humans are no longer the ones controlling and, no, and that they are part of the living um, uh, uh, tree of life, that we mm. and other organisms are relatives, that we all have one origin, right? Because of our similarity. And if that takes away their feeling of centrality and their feeling of um, being the best, then they have a problem with arrogance. And in the Quran, there are many verses that remind us not to be arrogant. Uh, and I think those who practice that are actually falling into that trap of being arrogant and saying, can I as a human being be uh, a, a relative of other organisms, whether it's another, uh, it's a frog or a mouse or an ape or a tree. Is it, and they consider that demeaning. I consider it the greatness of Allah that, mm. and the oneness of creation and this elegance and beauty of what Allah made, uh, that we are all uh, part of what Allah created and that we're not separate and the other uh, animals and creatures and, or, or living organisms are separate. To me, that does not speak to what Islam is or to what, who Allah is as he describes himself in the Quran. And it comes from this arrogance uh, of humans that we are reminded in the Quran not to behave that way. And we see that arrogance, that centrality, that dominance, that Anthropocene is a very Judo-Christian Western mindset of thinking that, unfortunately, we have adopted. And, and that's why this was never a problem in the past during the Islamic uh, flourishing civilization it only became as you said in the late eight, 19th century didn't have a problem with it it only happened later when we uh, stopped understanding Islam as we should and we borrowed the Christian kind of ideology mindset uh, framework of how we perceive our role in the world uh, around us and so we should and that's why I talk about evolution not because I'm going to convince you or not you're taking your vaccines you're taking your medicine you're eating your fruits and you're, you're using the fruits of evolution. I'm, I talk about it because I, so people are aware about what they're borrowing from other cultures and other frameworks of philosophy and how if they don't, if they're not aware of that, uh, they will always fall into that and they will always be followers. And the beauty of Islam that made us who we are in, in, in coming with a better life, a more uh, conscientious life of taking care of, of fellow humans and earth, we will lose it. Uh, and evolution is one thing we borrowed by mistake. What else? I always ask my question and my students, what else have we borrowed from the, the Western mindset? And we thought we, today we think it's Islam and actually it's destroying who we are as Muslims. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. And I, I just have one more thing, honestly, to really address, uh, which seems to be that the, the very focal point of this disagreement with, with people uh, is that Adam and Eve in the Quran are supposed to be the first human, the first humans, first male and first female. How can we fit that into an evolutionary uh, narrative, especially considering that there wasn't just one species, Homo sapiens sapien, which are what well, we are humans, uh, but considering all of the other different species of human that once existed, at different times, such as Homo erectus, the Neanderthals, um, all of these different species. So how can we merge these stories together uh, in your eyes, do you think? 
Yeah, so I, I, I challenge the question itself, right? Because you're saying that in the Quran, it has to explain every subspecies and every origin species of human beings. Is that the mm. purpose of the Quran? <laughs> I'm mm. asking you, is that the purpose of the Quran? I doubt it because the Quran's not yeah. about uh, like, oh, we, we had a mutation here and that that species evolved this way and that this way. And I have to find that evidence in the Quran for everything, because if that's the purpose of the Quran, then w w what about Einstein's laws and Newton and all the laws of the world? And that's not the purpose of the Quran. OK, hmm. it isn't. And 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 by and that's why I do not I say uh, I challenge the question itself because it can only lead you into rabbit holes um of and not into the actual truth so that's number one and therefore then what is the purpose of the of the of the story of adam and eve let's explore that how can it enrich our lives how can it make us behave better instead of getting mm. trapped into wait a minute uh neanderthals were not mentioned uh, uh what is it devonian species were not mentioned and uh, yeah. how long was it ago like what happened that's not the purpose of the quran now those who have interpreted the Quran uh, to a mean a particular meaning that people are holding on to uh, as as scientific truth, right? That's what people are doing. Mm. They also forget that science, Allah said, go use your mind and brain and ask questions and do experiments. He didn't say use the verses of the Quran as the scientific evidence for a theory. Look at Ibrahim and Allah. Allah didn't say go read the Quran and that's it. He said do this and do that physically. So mm -hmm. we, th so that in itself is an argument against using the verses of the Quran as if they, by virtue of the words, are scientific evidence to any scientific theory. So again, that's another trap that we must not fall into. Uh, and that's what people use in their arguments. They're saying, oh, the interpretation of this verse that Adam was the first guy. So Khalas, he's the first guy. So anything else that's contradictory to the, as if that verse is scientific evidence mm. when, when it's not. Uh, mm. And then, and, and that's why I even resist further. Yes, we could go into those verses and bring on language experts and try to find a way to interpret the verse to fit evolution. Okay. And that's what people call Ajaz al-Quran. I'm against that too. Because again, we're twisting everything up to make it fit. But the ultimate pr problem is not making it fit. The ultimate problem is under using it for a wrong purpose, which is like I said, it's not a scientific evidence. It's not a scientific book. And so, yeah, maybe I'll twist it all around and find the, uh, the hundredth meaning of a term to say, oh, there you go. The verse really talks about evolution. But then what if the theory changes? Right? <laughs> then yeah. I have to go back and twist myself in knots to try to find another way. Oh, interesting. Instead of wasting my time on doing science, using my brain, and, and using the Quran to guide me ethically and, and in terms of values, how to live my life. Hmm. To me, that's the catch. That's, that's a problem. And the reason people have are stuck on, on Adam and Eve and, and human evolution is because of arrogance. Because they don't have a problem that there's no Einstein uh, theory of relativity or quantum or string theory in the Quran. They're okay. Yeah. Right? They're okay with that. They're okay that not every planetary uh, motion is planned out, that not every random not every yes. whole is in the Quran. They're okay with that. And they're okay with science advancing. And they're okay with science changing. And they're not fighting to find an interpretation to fit them together. But uh, humans, oh my God, it's like a taboo. Because it threatens their mere existence. And that only happens mm. when you're not confident and you're the central thing of everything. And suddenly you feel you're not central. So you feel threatened, which to me is totally against Islamic philosophy. You should wow. not be central. You should always be in service of. You are part of something bigger. And again, that kind of thinking mindset is a very Judeo-Christian society thinking, which today in in science, they're refuting that and they're saying, you know what, We're, we can't explain nature anymore using the, the methodology and the approach and the framework that they have been using, which is a very Judeo-Christian framework where humans are in the middle. And hmm. for ages, this has been the problem with Christianity, because first they thought the earth was in the middle of everything, right? Hmm. And then they discovered, oh, it's not earth, it's the sun, it's not the sun, it's the galaxy, it's not, so there's, there's all, they're always looking for this centrality of themselves. Mm. Because the, their whole philosophy comes from a very different premise. Our philosophies were part of, of something greater. And it's how we fit together 
And, and actually, the way Islam looks at it reflects nature itself, which is, is a testimony to the um, presence of a creator. Because mm. the, the, the Islam we, we were presented with from Allah reflects the real nature that we are mm. perceiving with our senses. So to me, evolution makes me closer to Allah, makes me a better Muslim and a better believer. Wow. Okay. That's a, a very interesting proposition you're giving there, which is, I've never thought of before, which is instead of trying to, I'm just going to try to summarize, instead of trying to twist um, the Quran, which is a spiritual book and not a scientific book with reality, which science is uh, an objective reflection of reality or patterns within reality and trying to twist these things in so badly and constantly changing our interpretation and having all these doubts, we should keep them separate um, and they can go, or, or I guess they can uh, go along if you interpret it spiritually, the Quran, and not as literal uh, facts and logic and, and obviously because it does not explain every single thing it's supposed to be spiritual does that is that a correct way of thinking of it Ab um, absolutely and the proof of that correct understanding of the relationship between religion and science in islam the proof of it is that during the islamic civilization we had muslim scientists we had christian scientists we had jews jewish scientists right mm. so it was okay you didn't it wasn't about it was about the way the philosophy the mindset it wasn't about uh everything had to the quran had to be the scientific anybody could be a scientist because you're using your mind and your brain it's how you use the scientific discoveries to live your life where you need islam but the intellectual capacity you have is there and this is very important because there's all this argument about islamic science and anybody could be a scientist come on because mm. you're using you said you're using your objective senses of trying to understand the world Hmm. Right, and it's explained in the Quran. Use your mind, use your senses, use your intellect, uh, and it's then what you use, what you use it for, is what you can you you would use religion and uh, and so and um, uh, you know to set your guidelines, your values, your ethics on what is right and what is wrong. Okay, and just I guess now I'm kind of thinking from this point of view, people can't really look at the Quran and say, oh. This is a sign that the Quran is correct. A lot of Muslims that I know do this. They say, look, the Quran wrote about this and it's happening now. But that's kind of crossing boundaries saying that the Quran is supposed to be literal. It's, it's causing some confusion. But I would rebuttal with that. And I'd love to hear what you think about that is why do you need a sign within the Quran to believe in it? Shouldn't you have unconditional belief in the Quran, no matter if it confirms or does? That's actually a test of uh, of faith in and of itself it's like you don't need the proof you just believe in it unconditionally uh what do you what do you think about that concept so yeah that's a good question well first of all i i'm against using the the quran to inter uh, the proof that uh, some scientific discovery you can find it in the quran because the scientific discovery can change so what do you do then mm. right right yeah. it can't like yeah you could have said newton uh Proved it, and then uh, Einstein came along. Uh oh, so the Quran is wrong. <laughs> so you put yourself in a position where you're going to negate yourself at some point in the future in time, which is mm. a proof that that's not the right way of using the Quran. <laughs> so I resist using the Quran and, and to go dig and find scientific theories in the Quran, even as a testimonial, because of that reason. Now, if people want to use it, it's. I mean. I, I, I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, there are many verses that describe nature, describe it, right? Some, look, look at the samawat, look at the living things, look at the, but it's only to give you hints and to encourage you to go look and explore. And so I would use that to say, oh, look, uh, Allah's pointing to things like to the womb, to the embryo. He's, so go look and search. And again, mm -hmm. it's, it's the philosophy that the answer is not there. It is the Quran is not about providing answers. The Quran is about providing guidelines and encouragement to go use your, your capacities to explore the world. So so yeah. it's how you, because if you're going to say it's going to explain science, then you, it has to explain, it either explains everything or it doesn't. You yeah. can't have it sense. halfway. And so yeah. let's use it in the way that it was originally was for, which is to use it to learn about the world. Now, if somebody 
wants to, and I, with all respect, if somebody has used a verse and said, oh, look, it proves a scientific th or a scientific theory that's proven, you can find some uh, echo of it in a verse because you could interpret a word, a verse, and mm. use it. That's fine, okay? Uh, uh, in that, in, uh, that's fine if one wants to use that. But again, I uh, avoid it for the reasons I said. Uh, I, I lost my train of thought. I was going to say something about like why I, I... So if somebody does that, uh, I would not do it. I told you, I already explained why, but there was something else I was going to... Um, uh, 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 yeah, I remember. I'll repeat it so you have your podcast correct. So if somebody wants to use a, a scientific discovery or observation and say, oh, I can find a mirror of it or uh, evidence of it in the Quran, I mean, the, the, he or she are going to be uh, going to put themselves in a, in a challenge if, if science changes later. But the saving grace of that, even then, even then, is what mm. the fuqaha came up with, that if you if you are a mujtahid or a scholar and you... Uh, are correct, you get two rewards. And if you're not correct, you get one reward. <laughs> so even if they want to do that and then science changes, we can say it was a human error. Uh, and, and we're not blaming anyone. They did what they thought was right at that time, uh, but science mm. moves. And so somebody can come along and refute what that person said. And that's okay. Because just as scientists are humans, they use their intellect to try to explain the world around them. And uh, in a hundred years, another human being will come and he may come up with a new thing, and that's okay. Same thing. Somebody with all good intention could interpret the Quran in one way. And then in a hundred years, somebody else could come and interpret it in a totally different way because the circumstances are different. And they're both good people, and they both have good intention. And, and just it, it, this is human, and this is human error, and, huma and pluralism of humanity, and that's okay. And even if today we have more than one opinion about what the Quran could mean, that's okay. Same thing in science. We could have multiple people discussing science, each one coming with their own opinion, doing their homework, providing the evidence, hmm. and that's okay too. Because that's what's beautiful about Islam. It's about celebration of plurality. And it's with only with plurality we can advance and we can evolve. Not just in, in, evolve in, in terms of, which is very, it's the same concept of evolution. In the sense of yeah. and how and how we understand the world, how we hmm. interpret the world, how we use it. It's when we become very dogmatic and say this is one way and there's no other way. That's when we lose our flexibility and our agility. And that's why today in the Islamic world, when we stopped having al-ishtihad, uh, al-qiyas, those are the two things that keeps Islam alive for every time and place. And that's what's so beautiful about Islam. And by shutting those doors, we have actually... Uh, you know, um, restrained Islam into a very narrow uh, way of thinking, which is not what Islam is about and not what the beauty of Islam is all about. So celebrating pluralism and plurality is and diversity is wonderful and amazing. It's part of what Islam is, and it reflects nature and evolution because without diversity, we can't evolve. We'll all die like those olive trees that I described in the beginning. Yeah. If we're all the yeah. same, there's a change in the environment, we're gone. Okay. Um, and I just kind of want to end here with, um, I'd like to show you something, Dr. Dajani, and get your opinion on it. Um, so for any Muslims who are watching this, or you don't have to be Muslim, Muslim yes. I guess. I just want to point to a, a reference that I think many people would find helpful. This is a uh, book written by Dr. Shaib Ahmed Malik uh, called Islam and Evolution. And he provides this uh, amazing, like very comprehensive view of evolution. Everything you said today is, is mentioned in this book, um, but he explains within the book for people who are still wondering about the Adam and Eve question, um, he has these two versions of ways that we can very easily just see evolution because some people might still have an emotional uh, uh, repel towards this idea. There's this thing, this concept called Adamic exceptionalism, where within the phylogenetic the evolutionary tree, uh, some point within uh, the appearance of Homo sapiens sapien, we could have the possibility of the appearance uh, of Adam. And again, in this context, we, we have to change our interpretation of Adam as have, being instantaneously created uh, and, and, and created in the Quran would mean a uh, slow evolution towards this being. So um, what do you, what do you, there's also this other one here uh, that people can point to, which is called human exceptionalism, 
um, which talks about, it shows this evolutionary tree again, and then it stops, and then the creation of Adam, and then Homo sapiens sapiens. So I'd like to know, what, what are your thoughts, uh, perhaps, on these two uh, things that are presented by Dr. Shaim Malik? Okay, so I know, of course, I know uh, Shaib Malik very well. He's a very yeah. um, a, a, a colleague of mine. We disagree on a few things, and these are some of them. <laughs> we disagree uh, when we talk about uh, humans. So uh, I disagree with human exceptionalism for all the reasons I talked about before. Uh, it doesn't make sense from a biological point of view at all, and it doesn't make sense of the greatness and elegance of Allah either. Uh, hmm. So. I disagree with human exceptionalism as as you as you in the in the last uh, that Adam just appeared out of nowhere. Uh, and if you want to go back to the earlier one, the first slide. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and so I also know David uh, Jalajil, and I reviewed his book. And I think mm. we also I think if I remember correctly, but again I I, I don't have in my mind uh, there are different interpretations. But if I remember correctly, he's also about in a way human exceptionalism or Adamic exceptionalism, which I also disagree with, because to me um, this is uh, against the uh, the um, universality of Allah's creation and the connectiveness of Allah's creation um, philosophically, but mm. biologically. The, the DNA evidence uh, uh, gives no space at all for either explanation of an exceptional Adam or an exceptional human at all. It, mm. it, it doesn't make sense um, at all. Okay. So you're sorry if that yeah. disappoints people, but, but no way if everything has the same DNA, we have the same DNA. We, the difference between us and chimpanzees is less than point one percent you could look at one gene and you could find the same gene between we have it and the chimpanzee has it all right uh mm. it, and the difference is just a few different mutations different so how were we created instantaneously out of nothing the the it's it, it actually goes against uh allah telling us that we have a mind that we should use Whoever says that is telling us, don't use your mind, don't use evidence, believe mm. blindly, because we have to be very, very, very special. And I said, what? This doesn't make sense. You're telling me not to follow the Quran by using my mind, not to follow the Quran by saying that Allah created everything, and not to follow my mind by making humans exceptional and arrogant. No. <laughs> the Quran tells me to use my mind, to use the science and evidence, and discover that we're all one and created under Allah. We're all connected and that we should never be arrogant. We should use this to marvel and all and then protect and take care of all the earth and the universe around us. And to me, that makes a lot more sense and, and makes a lot more, uh, more testimony to the greatness of Allah. Uh, uh, yeah. And to me, this exceptionalism smells of Judah Christianity. Hmm. <laughs> and that's why I I I I I warn uh, of it. Okay. Okay. Um okay. And just I just I'm really I really want to ask one sneak in one little question if that's okay. Um how uh, how was you have you how has this been received within um universities within within people um is there a lot of pushback are people uh with you um I'm I'm curious to know because I've received some pushback, but not not always. I think most people are curious to know. They genuinely want to know the evidence, uh, but they've been told certain stories by certain people, and they've been led to believe certain things. So I, I want to wonder if you have the same conclusion. So if, if I, so, um, good question. So scientists, let's talk about scientists. Muslim scientists avoid the con, uh, avoid the whole discussion usually, because and I'm saying hardcore like scientists who understand the biology. They avoid it because they don't want to go into it. All right. And those who actually are evolutionary biologists, proper evolutionary biologists, agree with me. Okay. The people, you all the people you cited are not evolutionary biologists, by the way, none of them. So they don't mm -hmm. even qualify to comment. Uh, and this is not about desk research and paper research. This is like Abraham and Allah said, go do it with your hands. Mm -hmm. Um 
uh, if you talk about those who are not biologists, not uh, well, they may be biologists. They have to be evolutionary biologists, and then I can listen to their arguments. Okay, um, those who aren't, I tell them if you don't like my explanation, go, like Allah said, go do the science, go become an evolutionary biology biologist, and go find a different explanation that makes better sense. And please come and tell me all about it. I want to learn. I am curious. I want to really understand nature. To me, this makes the most sense. Evolutionary uh, theory makes the most sense of what's happening uh, in nature. If you don't like it, go do your homework, find a better theory by actually doing this research, uh, not by desk, like I said, and reading, and come to us and enlighten us. And that's fine. But that's my answer to them. Uh, now, you have religious scholars who have an opinion who may disagree with me. But again, I cannot interpret their research, they should not interpret my research. It's about everybody knows their own uh, field. And therefore, if they have a challenge with evolutionary biology, I invite them to go become evolutionary biologists and learn about it and read it. And if they think that that's, and, and dig deep, and if, if by the end of that, they don't like it, they have to come up with an alternative. They can't say we don't like it. They can't say we, because look, like, believe, agree. These are all subjective things. You have to go and do the back to Ibrahim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Go do mm -hmm. that. And if you do that, then let's learn together. Um, so this is my response to them. And and of course, and I and I remind everybody, this challenges our ego. This challenges the ego. And that's why we need to have a really hard look into ourselves. Why is it that this bothers us? Because many of them will agree with evolution, except with humans. And I say, well, why is that bothering you? <laughs> What is the, if everything else is fine, why is it bothering you that you're human? Why are you so stuck up on that? Look deep into yourself and ask yourself that question. Why aren't we humble? Yes. So mm -hmm. Those are like um, exist existential questions we need Except, to ask. Yeah. We need to ask okay. ourselves. Okay. Um, Dr. Dajani, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. I, I love this. This is amazing. Very fulfilling, emotionally, intellectually. Uh, is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we end? Yeah, the, even uh, so, of course, Christian scholars don't like me because I'm for evolution. Um, atheists don't like me because I am for mm. ev religion. <laughs> because I tell them <laughs> I have no problem. So I kind of break their bubble, yeah. right? Because they want to be that there's no God. And I say, no, there is. If I'm a Muslim, it makes sense to me. So I kind of disrupt their argument. Yeah. Uh, and I actually thank yes. them for their arguments because they helped me prove Allah. <laughs> so so it's kind of they don't like me <laughs> and the Christians don't like me and the Muslim scholars don't always like yeah. me. So in a way, um, uh, makes me feel, uh, uh, it makes me feel kinship and I feel with Darwin. <laughs> and I also feel wow. with, with, with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when you're alone and everybody thinks you're wrong <laughs> when, wow. when you're just being what is right and 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 um, and speaking up. But I also want to add that I am not one. I don't go into this to create an argument. And if you notice, I, I do not engage in debates. I have been mm -hmm. asked in many mm -hmm. times by people who disagree with me to have a debate. And I disagree to go into a debate, which I know is based on a premise where we're not going to agree. We're not even agree on the basis. And the reason mm -hmm. I, I disagree to go into a debate, because I'm not in this for the sensational, for the media, or to gain followers, or to be famous, because it, this is bad for me. Uh, so I don't go in there, because that's not my purpose. I go into mm -hmm. this discussion if somebody invites me to ask my opinion, and that's all I can give. As a, as a, as a Muslim scientist, I can say what science is, and these are scientific facts. It's not about what you think or what I think. Uh, unless you want to have a scientific discussion, but that's not of interest to the general public. That's a different thing because it's very high, high, uh, high, uh, uh, a high kind of discussion. And uh, mm. so I only, and as a Muslim, I am not a scholar to tell everybody what to do or what not to do. That's that in Islam, nobody has the right to do that. And that's the beauty of Islam. Only Allah can judge us. And Allah will judge us on our intention. And nobody knows the intention except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I, I do not preach and I don't impose any of my opinions on anyone. I, I share only my opinion. For those who are interested and want to ask me, I will share that. And then it's up to you and every listener what they want to do. And to use their mind and intellect to make that decision. And whatever decision they come up with, that's fine. 
right? So long as it's your opinion, not someone else's opinion. So long as it's based on your logic and thinking, as Allah asked you to, and not based on someone else's thinking. And then if you come up with an opinion that is different from mine, that's okay too, because that's part of pluralism. That's part of diversity. And, and again, if you learn something new, please teach me and, and inform me and enlighten me because we're all seeking the truth. Uh, and so that's how, that's, uh, that's how my last message uh, to everyone. Uh, and, that we're, and the beautiful thing is that inshallah one day in the hereafter, we will know the truth. And wow, wow. <laughs> and, and that's the beauty of life, you know, that having the capacity to explore, having the freedom to be curious, which is which my religion tells me to do, it gives me the best life ever, and the best reason to wake up every morning, and the best uh, uh, gratification to try to make this world a better place, in spite of all the atrocities and all the uh, wrong and bad and unjust things that are happening today. It's knowing that we have this capacity to explore and to and to pursue uh, based on our uh, purity of intention that only Allah can judge. I mean, okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah. Thank you.